Hello, everyone. Good morning for those in Brazil and good afternoon for those in the UK. Welcome to the third session of the UK and Brazil Partners in Energy virtual edition. My name is Flavia and I lead the oil and gas sector for the UK government in Brazil. It's a pleasure to have you all here with us today. Uh, before we start, I would like to cover some housekeeping points. Uh, there is simultaneous translation available in the session. To change languages, please select the option interpretation at the bottom of your screen, where you can see a small globe. This function is only available in the Zoom application. If you're accessing Zoom via the browser, you should not have this option and you will hear the audio in its original uh, way. Pessoal, essa sessão conta com tradução simultânea e a troca de idiomas pode ser feita clicando no ícone de um globo. So, uh, esse recurso apenas está disponível no aplicativo do Zoom, uh, baixado no seu computador. Uh, se você estiver usando o navegador, você terá apenas a opção do áudio original. Also, at the bottom of your screen, you will find the chat and the Q&A functions. Please use the Q&A functions at any time to send questions to the speakers. Uh, and the moderator will look into them at the end of the session. Please use the chat function to interact with everyone uh, at the event. We would like to see your comments and your perceptions about the subjects that are being discussed. Uh, in order to make uh, uh, this event as interactive as possible, we encourage you to use both functions throughout the event. You will notice that uh, all the microphones and cameras are disabled uh, for the attendees. This is necessary because we want to keep the focus on the speakers. This session is being recorded and the recording will be available at the YouTube channel of the UK in Brazil in the next few days. A link to it will be available at the website where you made the registration. All the presentations have been authorized well, all the presentations that have been authorized for distribution will be available uh, at the event website. I would now like to introduce Carlos Peixoto, the moderator of today's session. Carlos Peixoto is the head of the Oil and Gas Committee at the British Chamber in Rio de Janeiro. Currently a business management consultant, specialist in finance and project management, Peixoto spent the last 12 years helping companies navigate through the intricate Brazilian business environment, mostly doing interim management, business development, uh, strategic planning, as well as M&A, valuation, due diligence, negotiations, and management transition. Prior to that, for 25 years, he was the CFO of a US-based oil field services company company with various mandates in the Middle East, Central and Southeast Asia, as well as Latin America. Over to you, Peixoto. Welcome, and I wish you all a great session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Flavia. Good morning and good afternoon. And thanks to Renato Cordeiro and his team at the Department of International Trade for having me at this prestigious event. Well, here, here are my opening remarks. The challenges ahead are enormous. After having been warned by science for so long, finally humanity is awakening for the threat of climate change. We also face a great challenge in providing energy to continue to heat and fuel human development and the reduction of social inequalities while preserving life in this planet the way we know it. Our industry, as a major energy provider, has been up to these challenges and more. In recent years, both the majors, the independents, service companies, as well as regulators, have been dedicating the most experienced and brilliant minds of our business to look for ways of planning and implementing actions in order to respond to these new demands of society. Change is inevitable. Transition is a requirement. At today's session, the oil and gas industry towards a cleaner future, we intend to address some of these matters from the standpoint of relevant players in our area. First, we will listen to the UK Oil and Gas Authority, OGA 
and to the Brazilian Petroleum Natural Gas and Biofuels Agent, INP. Then we shall be presented with the thoughts coming from Oil and Gas Technology Centre of the UK, OGTC. Last but not least, Shell and Petrobras will share their views and discuss how they see this transition and the actions they are taking to respond to these challenges. We hope you, you will enjoy our discussions. Please note that we expect you to participate with questions. Use the Q&A button below on your screen. And let's make this a very participative uh, session. Our first speaker is Stuart Payne from the Oil and Gas Authority of the UK, OGA. Stuart Payne is the Director of Supply Chain, the Commission and HR at OGA. He is responsible for OGA's activity in support of the Commission, and he leads its work in the UK service sector. In addition to this, he is accountable for OGA HR function. Stuart co-chairs co the industry in MER UK supply chain the export tax task force. And he is a member of the Scottish government oil and gas industry leadership group. Stuart joined the OGA in January 2015, having held a variety of leadership positions in the oil and gas industry in the UK and overseas. Away from the OGA, Stuart is a chairman of the Brightside Trust and member of the advisory board of the Barnardos Scotland. Stuart was awarded a CDE for service in the oil and gas sector in the Queen's Birthday Honor list of 2020. Stuart, please take the floor and have a good presentation. Thank you very much. Can I just check? Can you see my slides okay? Yes, please. Go ahead, sir. Excellent. Thank you. And good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, let me echo my thanks to both Flavia, Renato, uh, and the whole team at DIT. Uh, I am holding up my uh, pass to this event in 2019, in happier days when travel was easier and we could get around. Uh, and so I've had the pleasure of being part of these conversations in previous years and had the pleasure of doing so in Rio. And I very much hope that in years to come, uh, we will be able to reconnect. I've been asked to talk a little bit about what the OGA is doing to support industry uh, to decarbonize and move towards net zero. And I'm delighted to, to do so. Um, before I start, again, my thanks to the DIT team for bringing everybody together for the event today. And thank you all for joining. It's more important than ever that we stay connected uh, during these very difficult times. Hopefully I can move my slides on. There we go. The OGA uh, was, is the, the regulatory body for the UK's upstream oil and gas sector. It was created in 2015. And what I wanted to talk about first is the OGA is how we use our role to help uh, support the decarbonisation of the sector. And when the OGA was set up, it was set up with a very clear purpose. The function, the purpose of the OGA was to maximize economic recovery of oil and gas. And one of the strengths of the model that we were set up with was that as well as having a clear purpose, that purpose was reflected in law, in legislation. And that legislation meant that there were burdens and responsibilities put on industry and on the regulator to ensure that that purpose was met. In addition to that clarity of purpose, the Oil and Gas Authority has always worked to try and foster partnership in what we call the tripartite relationship. That's to say the relationship between the regulator and government and industry to genuinely collaborate and work towards a common goal. So a key to our success working with industry since 2015 has been to have these clear expectations, clear rules, and legislation to support them, and a commitment to work in partnership. 
what we've decided that we needed to do in order to support the decarbonisation agenda was to look exactly at those same principles this time in the context of net zero. So at the beginning of this year, working with government, we've worked through legislation to rewrite the core purpose of the OGA. The OGA's purpose and the burdens that then flow from that, the responsibilities that come from that, both on us and on industry, have changed. Now, not only do we need to maximise economic recovery, but we also need to support the Secretary of State, the UK government, in achieving their net zero ambitions. So what the OGA has done is to take a model of having clear roles and responsibilities grounded in legislation and applying those into a net zero context. Another way that we believe that we can and do uh, help support industry in, in, in the work that we do both in transition and elsewhere is through effective communication, through sharing uh, clear messaging, not lobbying, but clear messaging that helps explain the purpose of our industry, what we're seeking to do and why. It's undeniable that for some stakeholders, transition should exclude oil and gas. That oil and gas has no place in energy transition or net zero for some stakeholders. We respect that, but we take a different view. And so we believe we have a responsibility to articulate that view and explain it, both to government and to industry and to investors. And we do. So we talk externally about the possibilities and the unique skills that come from our sector. This is about having cleaner, energy in the immediate term and having the new energy sources and energy systems that we need long term whether that's around enabling hydrogen through unlocking carbon dioxide storage and transportation or indeed leveraging the 60 plus years of experience that we have in operating in a harsh offshore environment we believe that the sector has a role a responsibility and a great opportunity both domestically and working with partners around the world. Within the UK, uh, we believe that hydrocarbons are currently still accounting for about 75% of our energy needs. And looking forward, hydrocarbons will remain a key part of that energy mix right the way through to 2050 in almost every scenario presented by governments. We need to ensure, therefore, that we don't lose vital assets, vital production. But we also need to ensure that that production is as clean as possible. This means working with industry to reduce venting and flaring from their operations and publishing data on this. So just uh, this week, so just last week, we report, released a report showing for the first time the exact levels of venting and flaring in the UK and showing that it was a 22% drop on the previous year. It also means requiring companies to look at electrification of their assets, which would reduce and remove the largest single form of pollution in our, in our offshore operations. And it also means ensuring that our operators, our oil and gas companies, have net zero strategies in place. We've met with all of our major operators and all of them have these plans in place. Finally, it's about setting clear expectations. And that's helped enormously this week by the launch of our stewardship expectation into net zero, which sets out in line with the legislation that exists exactly what we require of operators to do in the UK. And that leads me to another role that we think we can play, the use of data. Consistent with the approach that we take more broadly, we know that um, rhetoric or just uh, sales pitch and language isn't enough. We know that what we need to have both to build confidence in the broader stakeholder environment of society at large, investors, governments, and others, is to have really good data and to be able to share that data in a way that connects with audiences and provides the confidence that people need to invest in the industry and in the technologies that we're developing. So in partnership with other parts of the UK government and the Scottish government, as well as other regulators, over the last couple of years, the OGA has been working 
on a thing called the Energy Integration Project. <clears throat> as well as looking at the different combinations of technologies and opportunities that could be presented to try and tackle some of the net zero challenges. What that work also did was to take a view on if you did those things, what's the benefit? What's the value to the UK? What that work gave us as an example is shown on the slide on your screen, which is by looking at the impact that could be had in the UK CS, which is the offshore oil and gas industry in the UK. So in the waters of the UK, if you like, they have the potential to remove 60, take, take account of 60% of the UK's carbon abatement needs. So that's made up of different things. In some cases, it's new technologies such as carbon capture and storage in aquifers or in reservoirs. It's around offshore wind, including deep water floating wind and providing clean energy. But it's also about the electrification of existing assets. It's around the development of the hydrogen economy. So taken as a whole, what that allowed us to do was to talk to investors and operators, to governments and everybody else and say, the UK CS, the, the North Sea essentially, that has been at the very heart of the UK's energy story since the 1960s, can be at the very heart of the energy story for future generations as well. Data is also there powerfully for us to be able to hold people to account and to be able to measure delivery against commitments that they make. And that leads me to my final slide. Because one other obvious way in which we have a role to play in supporting the sector is to remember our role as a regulator. We have the ability and the powers to regulate operators in a robust manner. But working with the government, what we've done is develop alongside industry stretching targets for the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions within the UK. We use data and benchmarking of performance against targets to bring together the operators and show them the relative performance of different companies within the UK with the ambition that we could hold the companies to account through benchmarking and hold that all operators should be aspiring to the abilities and the standards of the best operators. Now we know as the OGA, we are one small part in a very complex system. We know back to the tripartite model that what's required is going to need governments and industry to work in close partnership together. But our industry is one that is needed today for energy. 75% of the UK's energy still comes from hydrocarbons. So we have a huge need today We've got the skills and the technology that can drive the energy transition in the medium term. And we believe that that then leads to having the skills, capability and investment that can be delivering energy long into the future. We should be clear as an industry on our responsibilities, but we should also be proud of the role that the sector can play in achieving net zero. The OGA will continue to play its part in trying to make that happen. And we'll continue to do so, holding on to the principles that we believe has allowed us to work well with industry in our first five years as the regulator. Firstly, that we ground what we do in a clear shared purpose, and that that purpose is supported by legislation and understood expectations on both the regulator and on operators. And that secondly, we hang on to the tripartite model that sees that we are more successful when we work collaboratively between the regulator, the operator and government. Thank you for listening. I'm looking forward very much to hearing the fellow, presenta pre fellow presenters presentations uh, and hopefully taking some questions at the end. But for now, I'll pass you back. Thank you very much. Stuart, fantastic presentation. Thank you very much, very inspiring to hear from the regulator of the UK this kind of message. And I, I took uh, two notes, widening the understanding of the role of our industry towards net zero emissions and the electrification. And uh, very well, thank you very much for your presentation. I'll 
I'll pass to now to Rafael Moura. Rafael Moura is from the regulator in Brazil. So Rafael is the superintendent of operational safety and environment at, at the INP. Welcome, Rafael. He holds a PhD in engineering from the University of Liverpool and a master's in risk management from the Cranfield University, both in England. And he has an MBA in enterprise management from the Getulio Vargas Foundation in Rio de Janeiro. He has a degree in production engineering with an emphasis in mechatronics from the CETEF Rio de Janeiro and a postgraduate degree in offshore systems from the University, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He also has several specializations such as executive leadership from the Cornell University in USA. Moura is a regulatory specialist at the INP since November 2005, having held several strategic and leadership roles as chief of the operational safety coordination, infrastructure and handling superintendent, board advisor, superintendent of operational safety and uh, environment, a function he currently performs. He was appointed to compose the list of replacement uh, directors for presidential decree on uh, January 2020, having been summoned to the, by the INP ordinance 264 to assume the role of interim director general, which he has assigned between September and December 2020. Pretty impressive uh, CV, Rafael, and uh, uh, thank you for your participation. Please take the floor and make your presentation, please. Thank you very much, Carlos. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, thank you, Breach and the UK DIT, Flavia and the whole UK team for the, the invitation on behalf of the ANP. Uh, well, it's always a pleasure to share our views as a regulator about the future of the oil and gas industry. We have a long history of uh, partnership, cooperation and friendship with the UK. Uh, since the introduction of the LNG facilities in Brazil more than 10, uh, 12 years ago, to recent developments such as the review of the decommissioning regulations and the establishment of the strategic environmental assessment here in Brazil, there were several joint initiatives supported by the UK government companies and uh, knowledge sharing programs, such as the Prosperity Fund. Um, the oil and gas industry is and uh, will continue to be vital for the sustainable development of Brazil. Uh, we have a vibrant and highly developed industry and uh, very important technological leadership, mainly in deep water exploration and production and a very, very clear drive to convert revenues in favor of our society. Uh, of course, in the transition, each country has its own uh, reality. And uh, for Brazil, we know that, uh, for instance, the availability of natural gas will grow from the current level of uh, 53 million cubic meters per day to 147 million cubic meters per day in 2030. Uh, natural gas uh, significance will grow. Uh, we believe uh, it's part of our transition to cleaner energy solutions and sources. And uh, we believe we cannot give up this important resource in our uh, current reality. We know that oil and natural gas will continue to play a key role in the global energy mix, ensuring access to cheap energy, or better, I would say to energy at reasonable prices, uh, especially for, for developing countries. However, to keep our industry social license to operate, we have to act responsibly. That's why we must reduce emissions and go towards a low carbon future. We truly believe the energy transition, which is in fact 
a movement to cleaner energies uh, is a turning point in human history. Uh, Brazil, for instance, alongside with the UK, is one of the global champions for the topic energy transition in the United Nations high-level dialogue this year. The focus is on decarbonization, renewables, and energy efficiency to ensure a just transition. Uh, in fact, that's why we are here today. Our challenge uh, is basically to ensure a smooth and timely transition uh, and make sure that the benefits of the industry are still outweighing immediate risks and consequences in the eyes of the general public inclusive. Um, our petroleum law clearly reflects our obligation to ensure the application of good practices during the whole life cycle of the fields to guarantee the rational use of hydrocarbons and to protect the environment. I can't think of a better way to implement the loss command than developing a regulation that fosters a safe and sustainable operation. In that way, our contracts evolved to comprise the application of the 17 sustainable development goals throughout the operations and uh, some new regulate, uh, regulations such as the decommissioning one uh, contain specific provisions regarding the implementation of a sustainability management system. Uh, we also monitor the greenhouse gases emissions related to the production sharing agreements uh, that are actually, as you know, applicable to the pre-salt region uh, to ensure that the formidable growth of our offshore production is not followed by some controlled emission uh, increase. And uh, we have a very close relationship with the local and federal environmental authorities, monitoring the requirements of the permits and ensuring technical and conservational aspects of the relinquishment and the uh, areas recovery are, are met. Uh, predicting the future is not a simple task, uh, but we know for sure that a sustainable future includes increasing efficiency and reducing emissions. Uh, the development of uh, intelligent and efficient ways to use our current oil and gas infrastructure to transport renewables and generate wind energy, and uh, also our de depleted oil and gas reservoirs for carbon capture and uh, storage is a, a reality. Uh, CO2 restrictions might accelerate uh, the reduction of the hydrocarbon usage, but if uh, we have emerging technologies and solutions to store or neutralize the CO2, uh, it could have the potential to prolong fossil fuels life cycles. Uh, we have a wide range of collaboration opportunities in that way. Uh, in a daily basis, there are also many practical measures to be taken to improve operational efficiency. Uh, for instance, a reduction of the gas leakages from valves and other sources, reuse of gas from process vents, uh, substituting uh, methane for nitrogen for purge operations to reduce blowdowns. Uh, so we have many ways to implement uh, efficiency and uh, uh, implement the concept of sustainability uh, in our operations. These are not abstract concepts. And um, of course, the experience of compensation schemes such as the decarbonization credits, the CBIOS uh, that we use in Brazil for fossil fuels could be adapted and uh, expanded to compensate flaring CO2 methane emissions and foster cleaner energy projects. Reg regarding the economic scenario, that these are very difficult times and uh, we must be prepared for what comes, comes next. Uh, Technologies such as automation, digitalization, the application of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, remote monitoring, and many others have the potential to create value and uh, enhance the operations. These are all interdisciplinary 
opportunities and uh, collaboration is essential. Uh, the countries and uh, businesses that are, that are actually capable of balancing the desire for cleaner, but also cheaper energy, uh, and uh, understanding the interactions between economic, environmental, and social needs will emerge stronger from the current crisis. At the ANP, uh, we are willing to accept uh, the challenge, attract investments and know-how, and to be a catalyst and facilitator for the transition. Uh, measures uh, are being taken from a policy perspective. Uh, yesterday, we have uh, was a big day for for Brazil with the approval of the new uh, gas law. Uh, and uh, from a regulation perspective, uh, we are working hard to play our part to collaborate and incorporate all the necessary triggers to ensure our industry will bounce back following the crisis in a more efficient and greener way. Uh, well, um, thank you very much again for the, the invitation. Of course, we will have a very nice discussion later in the, the Spano, and I hope you all stay healthy and safe. Thank you very much. Rafael, thank you very much for your intervention. Uh, I, know, I know you guys have been very busy with all the changes that uh, coming in and we, you just uh, managed to go through the, the new gas regulation and all this. Uh, I, 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 I wrote down two points of your presentation that uh, called my attention. Mitigating the risks associated with the change, very important days in my, in my view, and monitoring of the decommissioning activities. Uh, thank you very much for your points. Uh, we will go through the the program here now we will have uh, thank you rafael we will have uh, roger essen from the uk oil and gas technology center the ogtc let me just encourage you to you guys to uh, click the button on q a and uh, ask your questions okay to participate uh, roger is the head of the industry and member network at OGTC. As a head of the industry and member network, Roger spearheads the OGTC solution centric connection to members, technology developers, supply chain and stakeholders. Roger has more than 25 years experience in the oil and gas sector and has held a variety of supply chain leadership positions within companies ranging from SMEs to tier one contractors. And before joining the, the OGTC, he was chief executive of industry trade organization, Decom North Sea. Roger is an active member of the global Scott community and is a chartered surveyor, as well as a fellow of the Chartered Management Institute. Roger, let me pass the floor to you. Carlos, thank you very much. And if you can give me the thumbs up that you can hear me and you can see my slide deck. Marvellous. Thank you very much. Uh, and bon dia, good, uh, ah, good morning to uh, everybody and, and thanks for the opportunity to present today. Um, a little bit like Stuart, I don't have my pass from the last time I was uh, in Rio, but it was, uh, it was in... Uh, 2016, I arrived in Rio on the night that the Paralympics finished for what I think was one of the most depressing days ever to be in Brazil when all of the festivities had ended, but that was to attend one of the Britcham events uh, uh, on, uh, on decommissioning at the time. But thanks to um, Flavia and Renato and the team in, in Rio, um, who we've been working with for, for many years now and always provide us with them um, with excellent support and good linkages to uh, industry and, uh, and academia uh, in Brazil um, to, uh, to continue collaborating um, across the ocean. So I work for OGTC, Technology Driving Transition, and very much plays to what Stuart has talked about uh, and, um, and our other speakers. So where did OGTC 
come from. Uh, we were formed in 2017 with government money from the both the UK and the Scottish governments as part of the Aberdeen City Region deal, with our mission to be the go-to technology centre for the oil and gas industry in the UK and globally. And in that time since we came into existence, uh, we've got a strong track record of delivery. So with the industry, we have co-invested over £163 million in 265 projects. And importantly for us, we've achieved 110 field trials, which have either been completed, planned or underway. So very much how do we help work with technology developers and operators and others in the industry to develop and to deploy new technology. And that was aligned to our three themes in our technology vision of reducing emissions, unlocking the potential of the North Sea Basin, and transforming to net zero. So very aligned to the presentations you've seen from others uh, on the call today. And picking up on a few of those, the elimination of flaring, net zero decommissioning, the development of both green and blue hydrogen, and actually moving towards reuse of infrastructure uh, and um, carbon capture, storage and utilisation, working with the industrial clusters in the UK at the same time. So very much a clear technology vision, but it's important to recognise that some of the technologies we've delivered already have played an important part. The uh, the yellow device in the top there, the Ocean Power Technologies Power Boy, which has been deployed in the North Sea, providing power uh, to a subsea manifold. At the left hand side, the work that we've done with ECOS IP on alternatives for reduced carbon uh, decommissioning activity, through to the development and deployment of robotics in the offshore environment, which can play into down manning of facilities. But of course, since we came into existence, the world has changed. And it's not only our world as a technology development organization, it's coming from the companies that we work with, Equinor, who want to be a much more sustainable company going forward. BP, who aim to be a very different company by 2030. Total, who see that you don't just get rid of the past, you seek an evolution of the markets. And Shell, who we'll hear from uh, after I've finished my presentation. So although we have a new focus, we have the same purpose as we did uh, when we were launched. And that is very much aligned to the three uh, areas of focus that we have, which is enabling the oil and gas industry to diversify, to accelerate the development and deployment of new technology and inspiring not only the next generation coming through that want to be part of our energy industry, but how we encourage new companies into the offshore energy space as well. And all aligned to our mission of developing and deploying technology for an affordable net zero future. So we've undergone some changes as an organization. Some of you may have worked with us before or, or knew about our activities, but our seven solution centers have now been consolidated into one, but we have three clear themes, emissions reduction, energy system integration, and offshore energy 4.0. And as part of that journey, we've created a new technology roadmap. And that roadmap is designed to get us to net zero, aligned to the UK and Scottish government targets of 2045 and, and 2050, and the UK industry's own target uh, with Oil and Gas UK and Roadmap 2035. So our three programmes include things aligned to the development of oil and gas, because we have not turned our back on oil and gas. And as Stuart said, we have over 60 years of experience working on energy assets in the marine environment. But we still have focus on field development. How do we decarbonize production operations 
and logistics that support our industry? And how do we decarbonise the whole process around late life management and into decommissioning? But we also look forward and in energy system integration, we're looking at how do you integrate the system of renewables and energy storage with the infrastructure of oil and gas? How can we help to speed up the development and deployment of hydrogen at scale, along with other uh, clean fluid, uh, fuels? And how do we make carbon capture, utilisation and storage affordable for the future? I'd very much play into um, uh, earlier comments. Digitalisation and the use of digital technology, uh, artificial intelligence is going to be critical in this future. How do we develop the smart assets of the future? How do we automate and move towards more remote control? And how do we deploy robotics and autonomous systems, whether that's on a platform or in the marine environment itself, or even in the air? But of course, we must collaborate as part of the energy transition. And there is a cross sector commitment to work on developing and deploying technologies that will help us to get to that net zero future that the government in the UK and in Scotland uh, have indicated that we must achieve. And of course, the technologies and the lessons that we learn in the UK are direct, directly transferable to other oil and gas producing provinces globally. Hence, the desire to continue the effective working dialogue uh, and relationships that we have in Brazil. And you can see from this slide here, the range of different uh, organizations that we're working with in the UK, including the Oil and Gas Authority, the Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy, as well as industry itself through Oil and Gas UK, as well as the, uh, the offshore renewable energy catapult, very much picking up on the activity required for uh, floating wind at scale in the North Sea. But what are we doing in the research side of things? There are two key documents that you can download from our website, free of charge, that show the direction of travel of us as a, a research organisation and a technology organisation, but also for the industry itself. Our integrated energy vision for 2050 uh, paints a picture of what that uh, integrated system could look like in the future. And the Closing the Gap report picks up on the technology gaps that we must all be striving towards if we're going to achieve those 2050 targets. All available on our website, uh, www.ogtc.com. But it's not only the research and development part, we're working with new technology developers, new pre-revenue companies, companies who have a spark of a good idea and need some help to grow that business. And our TechX Technology Accelerator is now in its third year. We take 10 companies per year and we take them through a 16 week accelerator program, which gives them uh, access to the industry and people in a way that would normally take a company anything up to two years uh, to achieve without our help. And this year, our focus will be very much on clean technology and uh, the, uh, the program will open for applications from around the world. You do not have to be based in the UK, but the application process will open in quarter four. Our two national centres is our link with academia. OGTC supports both the Robert Gordon University and the University of Aberdeen. Our relationship with the University of Aberdeen is the National Decommissioning Centre, which uh, Flavia and Renato have helped us with connections to academia and Brazil. And we look forward to building relationship like the ones we have with Curtin University in Australia and Chulalongorn University in Thailand, but through Brazil. We also are launching this year the National Subsea Centre, our partnership with the Robert Gordon University. And again, I hope that we can foster collaborative projects from around the world, uh, working with academia in the northeast of Scotland and the wider UK in delivery of subsea opportunities. But of course, in summing up, the whole purpose of OGTC being here is to, uh, is to help industry to 
leverage the funding and unlock impactful technology that will get us towards that net zero future uh, much more quickly. We want to help to continue de-risking technology development and deployment. And this year, we'll be having a significant focus on the adoption of the technologies that we have supported to date, whether that's in the UK or overseas. But it's all, uh, it's all in uh, alignment to our objective of delivering a net zero future and continuing to develop and deploy new technologies for that net zero future. And with that, I will hand back to Carlos. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Roger, many thanks for your very enlightening presentation. And uh, I, I wrote several things here, but one is the questions. I mean, as a technology, as technology people, the questions you ask yourselves. Fantastic that you mentioned this. And uh, energy systems integration. That was another another important thing that I noted from your presentation. Thank you very much. And now. I'll pass to, to Susan Shannon from Shell. Thank you for joining us, Susan. Uh, Susan Shannon is the Vice President, Government Relations Organizations and Policy at Shell. In this role, Susan is responsible for maintaining relationships with international organizations, including international finance organizations, and multilateral organizations, including UN, OECD, G20, and the European Union. Susan's team, Susan's team leads Shell's policy and advocacy coordination on issues ranging from climate change to finance. Prior to this, Susan held a number of senior roles in government relations and communications in Shell, and has worked in a number of countries across Europe, Russia and the former Soviet Union. Susan has a BA in history and politics from Trinity College, Dublin, and an MCS in Russian and post-Soviet studies from the London School of Economics. Susan, thank you for joining us. Please take control. Great, thank you. So can you hear me and see me and then I'll share my screen? Perfect. Super good. Well, look, thanks a million for the invitation to be here. Thank you to Flavio, Carlos and, and all of the organizers. Um, you'll notice that I'm, I'm wearing green today and it's not an effort to send any political message or uh, be accused of greenwashing. But 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 I'm Irish and today is St. Patrick's Day. So I'm supporting uh, green. We, we like to call it, and perhaps the Brazilian people on the call will uh, not agree with me, but we like to think it's like carnival in the, in the rain because of the uh, European uh, weather. Uh, suffice to say, the, uh, the power of music and dance is something we are all uh, looking forward to being able to pick up again when uh, times change. Good. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Super. Okay, good. Um, you need you need you need to enlarge it. It's uh, control what? Control L, I believe. Is that um, large? Yes. Not yet. Control L. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. I think we have it there. Thank you. <laughs> Good. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit around Shell's strategy to become a net zero emissions energy company. I'll touch a little bit on both hydrogen and carbon capture and use and storage. And then I'll talk and make a link back to Shell in, in Brazil. So that is what I'm going to cover in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, this is a disclaimer, uh, asking you not to buy or sell any shares on the basis of what I say. So I will assume everybody has read that. 
So recently, Shell set out our own strategy. We, we set this out actually last month, and this really focused on how we will meet the ambition to be a, a net zero energy company while we continue to supply the world with the energy we need and to, to really get to the heart of the challenge around the energy transition, which is to continue to, to supply energy for all of the reasons that we have talked about already and, and that people are familiar with, while also ensuring that we meet the goals of, of the Paris Agreement and provide that energy in a way that um, is greener going forward and meets the, the net zero challenge that, that everybody uh, knows about. So we have set out our strategy in, in three pillars around where we see the growth, where we see the transition, and today the, the upstream, which will really fuel that transition going forwards. And just to step back before getting into the detail, the scale of the challenge ahead of us is, is really quite daunting. If I just share a few statistics if you if you to keep up with current demand current energy demand that's the demand we have today in the next two hours so that is not much longer than the time we're spending in this panel you'll see four very large crude carriers of oil loaded that's enough to fill the empire state building you'll see about 800 million cubic meters of natural gas Produce. That would cover a area the size of, of the M25 in London to a, a depth of a foot. And you'll see between eight and 10 cubic kilometers of water pass through hydro electricity stations. So that would, would fill Le Loch Ness uh, for, for, for those who, who know that. So the scale of moving from what we have today, and for those of you who have read Bill Gates' recent book, he talks about um, 51 billion uh, tons of CO2 per annum and, and that having to come down to zero. The challenge really is enormous. So how, how do we think about really meeting that? Uh, and let me take you through that qu quite quickly. So we are going to become a net zero energy company over the decades to come. There's three things that I'd like you to uh, remember from this slide. First of all, are what we call scope one and two. So the emissions from the products that we produce is only around 10% of the overall emissions from the, the use of our products. So our, our what we call scope one and two is really quite a small slice. It's the gray slice on the pie chart on the left hand side. We sell approximately three times more products than we extract. Uh, and the, uh, the CO2, of course, comes from, from the, the use of the product as well as that, that percentage from um, extracting them. So really, in order to change our, our company, we, we really have to try and, and help to, to change the energy system because we can only sell cleaner products if there is demand for those, those products. Um, what we are doing in our strategy is we are now taking account for the emissions in scope one, two and three. And that is a, a real differentiator and a real shift in how energy and, and IOCs uh, think about this. So we are saying, yes, we do need to be accountable for the CO2 of the products that we sell. And that means we've got to shift our company over time to selling much cleaner products, but we can only do that when the markets are there. So how do you work with customers to really change, change those markets and, and shape them? We've set out both short and longer term targets to do that. You can see some of those on, on the right hand side. Um, so that by 2050, we will be a company which only sell products which are either zero emissions or where the residual carbon will be offset across scope one, two and three. So, so what does that mean in practice? Well, if you think about the power sector, it's clear that, that you will see a shift from, from coal to gas to renewables. However, in, in transport, that, that is more difficult in um, uh, passenger vehicles, you, you, you will 
we'll go electric, certainly in cities, but in heavy duty or in aviation, there isn't yet a technology that will allow us to decarbonize uh, at scale. So you, you will have to offset in, in that case, although through the 30s and, and 40s, there are much lower carbon options uh, coming to market, including biofuels. So really, this is a story about the customer It is fundamentally a strategy rooted around helping our customers to decarbonize, helping to move uh, supply and demand together. So uh, as I said earlier, we, we can only uh, move as fast as society moves. We can only supply those products where there, there is a demand. Um, and so really working with customers to map out the pathways to net zero. And if you think about the aviation or, or the, the shipping sector, that really requires collaboration with, with governments, with everybody in the supply chain from those who, who supply the, the fuels, whether they are the crudes and jet fuels of today through to the, um, the, the bio and, and even the, the technology around hydrogen longer term. We've all got to work together uh, with airports, with customers, with, with regulators. So it's really what we call it a sectoral strategy to help our customers decarbonize. And um, 2050 is quite a, a long way off. So we've also laid out what the milestones are for 2030. What are we going to do to, to really meet those targets that we have set out for, for 20? 30, which are in the range of a 20% reduction or 40% when you look at the customers as well. Uh, I've heard a number of people here talking about flaring that is clearly um, uh, flaring and, and methane management of our own assets are a really important element. But when we look across the entire scope of our emissions, uh, that is the, the smaller element, there's clearly a, a big shift towards and uh, natural gas and, and we have said we expect that our oil production peaked in in 2019 and our co2 emissions in 2018 we will be selling a lot more uh, low carbon fuel and we will be selling a lot of, of power going forward so we've heard from others the story of of electricity and the need to electrify um, which is part of all of the scenarios. So a lot more low carbon fuels, a lot more electricity, and then the storage of the residual carbon emissions through both carbon capture and storage and through nature-based solutions. So you can see some of the, the targets and the volumes there. Um, let me talk briefly about hydrogen. Um, hydrogen, of course, is, is, a, is a carrier of energy rather than an energy source per se and it's widely used today the the real benefits of, of hydrogen are first of all that it is hugely abundant although you, you often you do have to create it and, and that isn't always easy uh, it can be made clean through both green hydrogen and, and blue hydrogen which is gas plus ccs and it is very dense which means that it is suitable for transport but also for heavy industry. So our strategy on hydrogen is, is really to orchestrate the supply chain. So to use uh, our ability to sell both to ourselves, because of course we, we use hydrogen today in, in refineries, and also to build out the, the demand, the market for it, whether that is, is transport or, or whether it is industry while we uh, drive down the costs and use the integrated position that a company like Shell has, where we are increasingly uh, in the, the upstream of renewables. So we, we own and, and develop the uh, renewable electrons and, and convert that into hydrogen at electrolyzers, um, in particular looking at a number of, of hubs. So creating supply and demand and, and using our own position as a, essentially an anchor, an anchor customer. Um, I, I won't take you through all of this. It, it gives some of the proof points where we are actually building electrolyzers and, and some of the biggest in the world at the moment we are involved in, uh, and that is to produce green hydrogen. We are also playing in the blue hydrogen space and have big ambitions you can see if you, if you look down to towards the, the bottom of the slide you, you see the bigger scale ambition there where, where you think about taking Rotterdam is, is a good example where you have uh, offshore wind ambition you then take the electricity 
you can sell it to through PPAs directly to uh, tech companies into data centers. You can put it into an electrolyzer and, and make the green hydrogen either for industry or transport and or you can trade the, uh, the, the electricity directly. So lots of options when you have a, an integrated company and that's the way we're thinking about it. This really illustrates that supply and, and demand story and shows the optionality that we believe we have, have some advantage around when you have that integration and you have the ability to anchor your growth in a, a customer. Um, so that, that is the way we are, are thinking about the, the commercial case for, for hydrogen, uh, as, as well as the technical case. Um, carbon capture and storage, and I'll, I'll finish shortly on this. Uh, we have a, a, an ambition to have about 25 million tonnes per annum captured in, in CCS. We have uh, and are involved in a number of projects around the world, some of those you can see. And we're, we're thinking about... Um, CCUS through a number of lenses, first of all, to help with our own emissions. So you can see there on, on the right, net zero emissions from our own operations. So thinking about uh, using CCS in, in that case. Secondly, uh, you know, how you use it to, to provide zero carbon energy, whether that is, is through refineries or other production processes, and increasingly there are customers and, and those customers are willing to, to to pay what you might say is that the green premium because they have their own commitments on net zero and thirdly as a service so that's the the hub model where you would essentially gather uh, co2 from a number of sources and bring it into one place so the, the northern lights project in norway operates on that model at the moment we are uh, working on, on a number of, of models and, and concepts around ccus um, this gives a little bit of a flavor as to how we are going to hold our, ourselves and how others will, will hold us accountable for delivering this strategy. It talks about everything from, from our transparency on climate lobbying through to our decision making and our accountability. So we will put forward an energy transition plan for, for an advisory vote at our uh, AGM for the first time and, and, and we will uh, people have mentioned the TCFD, so we will remain aligned with that as it goes forwards. And um, maybe finish with uh, a link back to, to Brazil and, and Shell's role in Brazil. I think this slide speaks for itself, so I won't go through it. But today Shell is involved in, in many of the activities that I have talked about in Brazil. Clearly, the, the upstream is a heartland for Shell. And our activities in Brazil are absolutely critical to the, the Shell group going forward. And, and as I said, the, the upstream will really be the, the engine for allowing us to thrive uh, through the energy transition and uh, fund the transition, as well as the, the, the dividends that, that we are committed to. So Brazil is, is really a heartland, but we are also invested in, in Brazil in the, the transition pillars, in the gas, in the growth pillars, where we see around re renewables and, and power. So in many ways, Brazil is a uh, perfect country for us from an energy transition perspective, because it, it holds all of those different uh, lines of business, which we will need going forward to meet the, the multiple of, of challenges that we have if we're going to uh, succeed going through the energy transition, which we absolutely intend to do as Shell. Thank you very much. Susan, look what I wrote here. It is inspiring to listen to how professionally and passionately all of you at Shell, at Shell deal with these challenges. Fantastic. Thank you very much for, for the complete view of what a major energy company, uh, actually one of the leaders of this market is doing. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your presentation. Now let me let me go and and we have we have a lot of questions already, and uh, it's very good. And uh, Viviana Coelho is now on the floor from Petrobras. Uh, 
Vivia, thank you, Viviana, for joining us uh, today and to spare of your time to dedicate to this, uh, to this event. Thank you. Viviana Coelho is the Corporate Emissions and Climate Change Manager at Petrobras. She is a chemical engineer from the Federal University of Paraná, a biologist from PUC Paraná, the Pontificia Universidad Católica, with a master's degree in environmental technology from the Imperial College of London, an MBA in advanced administration from COPEAD, a postgraduate degree in innovation from Unicamp, the University of Campinas, and extensive executive training in institutions such as INSEAD, IMD, IBGC, the, the Instituto Brasileiro de Governança Corporativa, Cambridge University, London Business School, and Columbia University. At Petrobras for 18 years, she currently also reports the, represents the company on the executive committee of the oil and gas climate Initi initiative on the climate change group of IPECA. Previously, she served in various functions in the areas of downstream, and at the research center, Sempis of Petrobras. Among them, as general manager of the portfolios of innovation in gas, energy, and sustainable development. Prior to Petrobras, she served as a consultant to multinationals in multiple segments in several countries. Viviana, thank you very much, and please take control. Thank you very much for, for the presentation, and and thank you for, for the invite. Uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity and the presentation so far, as you said, have been most inspiring for me as well. So I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see if it works. Can you already see it? It's coming. Okay, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, so the way we, we see climate change in, in Petrobras is that transition to low carbon is now an imperative. It is in every aspect of the energy business. And we, we like to, to see it, the, our, our preparation to it, around three pillars. So first, uh, it requires transparency and it requires quantification of carbon and making sure that you have it in all of your processes. It is now part of competitiveness. It's, it's an ethical and a competitive requirement to have uh, good uh, performance in carbon. Uh, obviously, Petrobras is a very strong producer of oil and gas and we have as also as a pillar, the resilience of our position in oil and gas in view of the low carbon transition. And we, we, talk, we call it double resilience, which is developing the hydrocarbons that are fit for the world that is decarbonizing. So all of our scenarios now show uh, the transition ongoing. What changes is the speed of it. So we, we have scenarios that are that involve a very fast transition. We have scenarios that the transition is not as fast, but in all of them, there is transition and in all of them, there is substitution of energy. And also in all of them, as it has been mentioned before, there is oil and gas for some time because the infrastructure is so large. The infrastructure from the user is so large that uh, really for, for the world to have energy, you need to have uh, oil and gas for some time. And we wanna make sure that the oil and gas that we produce is the oil and gas that is required by the world. And it requires double resilience. You need to have affordable energy, and that means very low cost oil, and you also have low carbon oil. And I'm gonna talk about, about a little bit about that uh, further in the presentation. We also have a third pillar, which is strengthening the skills to thrive in the low carbon transition. So as I said, the transition exists. It is uh, a clear uh, uh, tendency and opportunities arise 
from the development of markets. So you're going to have more markets for other products. And in Petrobras, we want to be prepared for that. So we, we work around these three pillars. One of them is carbon management. It's like making sure that we account and consider carbon in everything. The second one is very much around the oil and gas production and making sure we are uh, resilient producers. And the third is about having the transitions for having the skills for the long term and to capture and leverage new opportunities. Uh, as I said, carbon performance is an imperative and it is an ethical and a competitive imper uh, imperative. We have uh, a lot of oil and gas in the matrix today and we have in excess of a billion vehicles that use uh, oil products and not oil, all oil is the same right now. You literally have oil that is produced with five or six or even 10 times more carbon than other oil. So the way, the way we see it is that there is an immediate contribution, a material and immediate contribution by the industry just producing the, the oil that is required by the market in the cleanest and the lowest possible carbon way. Uh, if all the world were to consume now the most efficient oil, the emission would reduce immediately because just because the oil is produced in a more uh, efficient way. So, so this is one of the pillars of our strategy. And I don't know if it's uh, to the knowledge of, of everyone that Petrobras has had six years um, of reducing emissions in its operations. We, we currently operate with the same level of emissions of a decade ago, despite the fact that we have been raising operation and, uh, operation production. So uh, in fact, we also have uh, a target that reduces 25% of our absolute emissions up to 2030. So I like to say that this is a material immediate impact which is like reducing emissions right now, reducing the total emissions of the company. And that is 100% coverage. So it improve, involves all of our business, logistics, refining, and oil and gas uh, production. So we have a history of reducing emissions and we have targets to continue reducing emissions. And the reason why we were able to do so is because we have a very good story in the last decade of improving our carbon efficiency. Uh, so we are now one of the companies in the world that currently at this very moment operates one of the best carbon efficiencies in the upstream sector. Uh, in 2019, we operated with 17.3 kilos of CO2 per each barrel that comes out of our wells. Uh, it is improving. We have a target to get to 2025 at the level of 15. It was 30 in 2009. So that is literally 40% less carbon per unit of hydrocarbon that we produce. And obviously this increase in efficiency is what allows us to uh, uh, produce more and re reduce emissions at the same time. So we are talking about a 40% reduction in carbon intensity of our upstream operations in the last decade. And the results are getting better. Uh, as I said, so we have a good, a very good track record in this in the last 10 years, but we are moving forward and we have a set of commitments to the to 2030 and 2025 and those commitments cover all of our emissions. It involves a commitment on improving absolute operational emissions that I already said, reducing 25% of the emissions by 2030. And we also have commitments on flaring. On CCUS, uh, we are now at 7 million tons of CO2 injected per year. We are hoping to reach 40 million tons of CO2 reinjected, um, accumulated by 2025. We have uh, improvements in the intensity of the upstream, of the downstream segment, of the refining segment, and also specific targets on methane. So we have a very comprehensive midterm set of targets for 2025 and 2030 to make sure that when we talk about Petrobras oil, we're talking about oil that is produced with the best practices in the world.
in terms of carbon. We do have a dedicated investment for that, which is for, for, for our set of commitments, which is in our last strategy, uh, budgeted as $1 billion. Uh, there's a number of innovations that we are developing for, for meeting our mid-term targets and obviously also the long-term targets of the company. So we're talking about reinjection of CO2. Uh, in 2009, we were at 4.6 million tons of CO2 reinjected. At 2020, we are way above it already. Uh, it's one of the largest projects of CCUS in the world. We are, we are implementing flare gas recovery system, trying to zero flaring in all of our operations. We are discussing fully electrified plants that can be much more efficient. Uh, subsea separations, digital transformation. So really we have incorporated carbon in all of our technological roadmap. Uh, as I said in the beginning, there's, you, cannot, you cannot do that unless you have carbon in the decision-making process. And that involves strong scenarios and Petrobras has 10 years, uh, more than 10 years having climate change incorporated in our planning scenarios, you need to have governance. And we now have climate change at the highest level of the organization, uh, both with, with committees at supervisory level, at management level, and uh, a C-suit area to take care of it. Metrics, and we're talking about financial metrics, we're talking about performance metrics, uh, targets, culture, customer relations, procurement, Everything has to be uh, has to incorporate it, carbon in the decision making target to make this sort of change. And uh, one of the things that we have done is that we now we have four top metrics in Petrobras, and one of them is carbon performance. So it is now one of the variable remuneration for all employees and obviously to all of the executive management. Uh, one of the most important things we have done in 2020 was to change our assumptions, our key assumptions for our business. Uh, in a world that, that meets the Paris Agreement goals, you're going to have persistent oil, but less and less oil as time progresses. And as I said, it is in the best interest of the world that you have the oil that is required by the world produced with the least possible emissions. And it's also in the interest of everyone that we develop the, the oil fields that actually fit in a Paris aligned world. So we have reviewed our key assumptions for planning. And we now use a long term of uh, price of oil in base quantification scenario. So in our own quantification scenario or $50. And we use a resilience criteria that break even for new investment has to be below 35 degrees. Now, those are numbers that are aligned with fast transition Paris aligned uh, scenarios. So uh, what, what we want to do is that we want to take decisions of investing in fields that really are fit for a Paris aligned world. And you can only do that if you invest in your very best assets, in the assets that really have a reason to produce in the world that is going to require less oil. Uh, and this is not sensitivity analysis. This is base scenario. So it's like really into the economic assessment of our investment. Uh, just to, to finish it off, I talked a lot about operations. Uh, we do believe it is, as I said, an imperative that we take proper decisions, good decisions on which fields to develop, and that we, we move our operations always in the lowest possible carbon. But obviously, as I said, the transition brings opportunities and the transition brings changes. Uh, and so we have a wide R&D portfolio to build on world-class opportunities to the low carbon transition. So we understand there are going to be new markets, as we have been extensively discussing in the call. We have hydrogen, we have um, electrification as a clear tr trend. Uh, uh, we have uh, biofuels. Petrobras is a strong electricity producer, one of the largest electricity producers in Brazil. Petrobras is a very high producer of hydrogen for our own operations. So we keep this R&D portfolio 
to leverage the synergies with our capabilities, infrastructure, and our own demand, our own demand for energy, our own demand for hydrogen, so that we can build world-class opportunities to, to the low carbon transition. And we have a recent example of that. We have a long history in researching uh, advanced biofuels, and we have just announced our plans to move into industrial production of biofuels. And here I'm talking about hydrogenated, renewable diesel, and uh, hydrogenated bio kerosene for for aviation. So it's a it's a new market for for Petrobras of advanced uh, biofuels that we hope to to launch, given the requirements of society and our capabilities on deep conversion and our experience with with hydrogenation. We also have uh, voluntary investment on uh, forest and climate. We, we do not, none of the targets that, that I showed to you require offsets to be met. All of our targets are intrinsic performance targets. However, we do have an extensive decade long portfolio of natural climate solutions. Uh, we currently have 15 projects in the Atlantic rainforest, in the Amazon, in Cerrado, in Caatinga. And those are very high quality products that, projects that not, o not only um, uh, capture carbon, they also restore ecosystems, they produ provide livelihoods, they improve the economics of uh, communities that depend upon the forest, um, etc. So I think that's what I had to, to show you and I'm very much open for the debate. Thank you, Viviana. Uh... Petrobras is our market leader, and it's very good to, to when we see the, the directions Petrobras are going. It's, it's very appreciative. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, you said a competitive and ethical requirement. It's, it's, it is. It is fantastic. Thank you. Uh, let's go now to the Q and A's. Uh, we have seven minutes left before 11.30, which is our, our commitment with the group. Uh, I'm reading them now here. We have, uh, there is one, there is one that Roger asked to address. Roger, if you could please uh, uh, go and say, uh, uh, they, they, Vicente Fakina asked, on unlocking hydrogen, do you mean it from hydrocarbons? I mean, gray, green, all this thing. Please, Roger, go ahead. Uh, so I think we're, we're dealing with the transition at the moment, but very much moving towards green hydrogen. So can you produce hydrogen at scale offshore with a floating wind turbine or a wind farm? connected to a platform and be producing hydrogen at scale that you can blend and transport back to shore. And actually, I even had a conversation with somebody last week about converting the hydrogen to ammonia offshore and transporting the ammonia onshore as a fuel. So, but very, very, very much moving from where we are just now, um, gray uh, to blue to green as the ultimate destination. Very good, thank you. Uh, uh, Rafael, we have one from Marcelo Marques. He says, how do we convince customer, consumers that cleaner energy is necessary to planet and while the people uh, still prefer cheaper energy that comes from fossil? Would you mind to address that one? That's a very good question. Um, actually, uh, most of the cars that are manufactured in Brazil are flex fuel, so they accept ethanol and gas fuel. Uh, we actually we cannot control the needs and the pockets of the the customers, uh, but we already can opt between a fossil fuel or a renewable here in, in uh, Brazil. So it's not a matter of convincing, but giving options and promoting competition between different fuels and uh, society and uh, the customers can uh, choose uh, based on their principles and pockets as well. 
Yeah, not only not only that. I mean, we we and we 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 we, we hear here from Susan from uh, uh, Viviana uh, that that uh, competitiveness is important, and we we are making we are making this transition to be affordable. We need to we need to 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 go to clean energy on an affordable way. We need to keep heating and fueling the the humanity, but at competitive prices. Uh, Susan, I have a question for you here that was addressed to you. Susan, what are the opportunities that Shell sees in Brazil regarding offsetting their emissions, such as capture by flow forests, renewables, etc.? Yeah, thanks. Great, great question. So I, I talked a little bit about where we see the, the growth and, and clearly you know, biofuels with the, the rise in and, and where Brazil is on this is a huge part of that. Um, and, 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 and Shell uh, is very proud of that and it will continue. But you're right, the, the nature based solutions and the opportunities for for natural offsets are clearly huge in, in, in many parts of the world, in, including Brazil. The regulatory environment around this is really important to get right, uh, to ensure that there is credibility around the, the accounting of, of offsets and ensure that there is, isn't double counting vis-a-vis -vis what is in country NDCs. So there are huge opportunities in Brazil. And I, I think it is also important to state because, it, you know, in this offsets conversation, there's often a perception that companies are, are using offsets to continue business as usual. The order really has to be avoid, reduce, offset. So that is very clearly what we are saying. You avoid, you reduce, and then you offset. So you're offsetting against the residual emissions that uh, that will remain in the system to 2050. So yeah, huge opportunities in, in Brazil. Thank you, thank you. We have one uh, from Fabio Caldas from British Channel Lightsaber to Stuart. He says, which elements in the transition model presented by Stuart could be incorporated in the Brazilian transition process, considering the specific features of the country's environment? Clean energy matrix, press out, etc. And I open this with with uh, Stuart, and then maybe uh, Viviana could uh, could add up. Uh, so, uh, declaring my uh, my lack of knowledge about AMP and their work, and I'm sure Raphael will love me commenting on on this. Uh, the one thing I would say that I think is translatable, is common, is having as simple and as understood a set of rules as you possibly can. And so, you know, the, the, the pre-salt is there as an example. Brazil has made huge success of pre-salt exploration development over the last 15 years, 20 years. But making sure that there is clarity around the economic environment for companies to invest into. And so one of the things I think that our journey has, has worked on is to simplify whether it's taxation issues or other regulatory issues, a, an easy way for investors to be attracted in. They know the rules, they know the opportunities, and they can plan for them. That's, I think, something that I know Brazil does, but I think everywhere can continue to do to make sure that it's a simple place for investors to be attracted to. Rafael, do you want to make uh, any additional remarks? Wow, I, I think it's it's perfect, and uh, that's why we are going through the massive uh, uh, change in our our resolutions. We've been successful with uh, many initiatives to attract investment and uh, create that certainty that attracts investment. Actually, so uh, uh, that's that's the way to go. Yeah. Viviana, uh, considering your experience in this market, do you want to make uh, some remarks on, on, on this one? Well, I am, I'm under the impression that everything he said is applicable on um, like the understanding of the role of oil and gas uh, in, the, in the long term and the, the, the need for the oil and gas industry to decarbonize and the importance of uh, 
making sure that we reduce emissions from operations, the importance to value integration, the current infrastructure. And, and so I think everything is, is applicable. And obviously Brazil has particular issues, like we operate very far from the coast, we have a long, uh, uh, very deep water. So some, things must, some, some of the opportunities will be adjusted to the specific circumstances, but not the, the complete uh, setting. And I would also say that the, the, the goal of the simplicity is very good because we have to have something that is uh, predictable. And overall, what is good for society is that you can reach the largest possible reductions at the shortest possible time with the lowest possible cost. And simplicity allows that usually better. If you do everything like two separate, and sometimes you, you end up paying more for something that has less reduction. So, so I, I, would, I would pretty much endorse everything. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. Danielle Smith presented one here that I open, I open to whoever, whoever wants to, to contribute. He says, what do you think are the biggest barriers to collaboration in the newer energy industries and also the more mature sectors? Barriers, that's a, that's a good thing. Who volunteers? Well, I'll stick. My, I'll stick my hand up to, to that one. I think, I think what we're seeing is this is all moving at a pace that none of us have experienced before. And uh, in the downturn with oil and gas, you've seen many companies that have broadened out the, the, their, their service offering into renewables. And actually, you're finding that many of the same companies that are involved in the oil and gas space are getting involved in the offshore energy space now. And it's actually, it is actually quite collaborative. And we've got, we've got a number of different projects up and running now where we are working hand in glove with the, the regulator for offshore energy. You're working with the, you know, the, you're working with the OGA, you're working with Bayes, you're working with the Crown Estates, you're working with the provider of the wind turbines. You're work Everybody is looking at how we integrate the energy system and it's being able to paint the picture of the greater benefit of the integration. But green hydrogen will not happen if the offshore providers of, of uh, energy can't work with the, the owners of the current infrastructure. And there's a lot going on in that space and Stuart's about to jump in, I think. So if that, yeah, I'll, just to build a little bit on what Roger has said, there's, for me, there's two things. One is you've got to, you've got to show the prize. Okay. So you have to show the value. And so one of the things that I think we can always improve on is explaining, for example, to an offshore wind company, why would they care about the oil and gas sector? Well, these guys could be your customers for your very expensive floating deep water wind for the first 10 years of their lives pay for the capital cost, producing green hydrogen while decarbonizing their platforms, you've then, so there's a partnership that you can build on, on, on pretty simple economics. But the second piece, which is much more important and one that we are just now, I think in the UK, getting our arms around, is making it all visible. So we've started for the first time visually publishing on our website, you can go on now on your phone and see an integrated offshore map of everything whether it's oil and gas licensing areas, whether it's wind licensing areas, where the infrastructure is, where the planned infrastructure is, which allows both the operators, the investors, the regulators, and the supply chain that service them to see the map. Uh, before the days of satellite navigation in cars, most of us wouldn't have just jumped in a car for a long drive. We'd have checked the map to work out where we're going and what's on the way. So we have to make those things really visible uh, and, and and make them really attractive to people. I think. I see. I see. I see education also as a barrier. I see uh, a problem of uh, preparing the manpower. I mean. I mean. How? What could you comment on this? Wow. Uh, maybe I can uh, I can uh, comment on that. 
uh, I think that the issue of uh, transparency is very important. So uh, when uh, you have all the data exposed, benefits, risks, balanced and uh, uh, transparently exposed, uh, I think that you can uh, have more, uh, uh, you, you can have some good discussions about the ways that each society based on uh, the potential, based on the resources available, based on uh, energy needs that you can uh, implement and collaborate and uh, with uh, which pace as well. Susan. Yeah, I think, you know, it's a great question. I think there's something about understanding really the complexities of the challenge ahead of us. So it is quite easy to say, okay, you just, you know, add lots of renewables and, and you can continue to add renewables to the power system to 100%, we will still have only addressed a small percentage of the problem. So there's certainly a piece around understanding. I think there's a piece around consumer understanding and, and monitoring, reporting and verification of the embedded emissions in what they use. And I also think there's something around mindsets and behaviors. Yes, we need to collaborate across our industry and with this group, but increasingly we need to collaborate with the tech companies who are, you know, in our case, our competitors. Um, they are huge drivers of, of demand growth as well. So I think we're challenged on so many areas of, of this and, and that also boils down to, to mindsets and behaviors. And I think sometimes at the moment it feels like as the oil and gas industry we're doing an awful lot of apologising when the industry itself has done a, a huge amount of good over the last 50, 60 years. And Stuart said it himself in the presentation earlier, you know, we have 60 years of experience of working on energy producing assets in the marine environment. And it's all or a lot of it is transferable to the, to the new future. So... I think we need to we need to celebrate the things that we have done, recognizing that things are changing fast. The world is moving on. Consumers are 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 uh, driving a lot of this this change. But I looked at it just before I came into the call, and the demand for electricity in the UK at one o'clock today was thirty seven gigawatts, and forty three percent of that was coming from fossil fuels in the UK. That's not easy to replace quickly unless you tell everybody to switch off their PCs and their electric hoovers and all the other appliances that they're wanting to run. There's, there's a balance here. Viviana, do you want to make some remarks about this? I mean, education, barrier, advocacy. Do you want to make a, a remark? We have uh, two minutes and then we will adjourn. Yeah, I think society has many strata, let's say, right? And I think I'm going to I'm going to point out that we really need frameworks and transparency so that the consumers also can have their educated choices. So there there is nothing there is nothing that's going to make someone that has no money to put food on their table to pay more more for basic energy. Uh, but that is not my case, for instance. Uh, I pay organics <laughs> for, for, for my food and they're more expensive. And I would also pay more for products that would be decarbonized, for instance, but we don't, we don't even have those frameworks yet. For the consumers that are at the top of the pyramid to be able to take the informed decisions and then drive the scale and that will eventually drive down the costs so that everyone can have that at the same point. So I would, I would say that clear frameworks, transparency are the key point that is gonna also educate society because by the time those markets exist, um, people start adhering to them. And right now, as we were saying, you, you have the same product like, and we can talk about from oil to any consumer good, they can have five times more, more carbon content and you don't know about it. You don't know when you put gasoline in your car, if the gasoline, well, in Brazil, it's different because we have like a very specific market, but in any other country, you don't even know what is the, the footprint of that gasoline or anything else. So I think that is the crucial point for change. And obviously it's gonna bring a different culture as well. 
Thank you, Viviana. Uh, it's 11.40 and uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you personally. Thank you in the name of our sponsors and uh, Flavia, I would like to turn the, the, the floor to you so you could uh, close the event. Thank you very much personally and happy St. Patrick's Day, Susan. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, everyone, for, for the availability to make uh, this session with us today. I'd like to thank uh, all the attendees as well for, for having uh, registered and, uh, and making the time to be here. So, and Carlos, for, for your moderation, which was uh, brilliant. Thank you, all the speakers, to the, the, the participation and the comments. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really great to have this, this discussion and I uh, hope we can, we can make another one uh, 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 soon. So thank you everyone again. Hope you have a good day uh, or end of the day in the UK and uh, keep safe. Bye-bye.